Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about uh, endometriosis. The talk was going to be divided into three so that we can um, talk about the general concepts first and then go into specific detail afterwards about the primary manifestations of the disease endometriosis. These are the learning objectives that you can read over yourself, but the concepts are the same, just a general overview about the pathophysiology and the approach to the diagnosis of endometriosis. That will be part A. And then the other two parts will focus more on the management of the different manifestations of endometriosis. So first of all, the concept of endometriosis as a disease syndrome uh, it does require a specific definition. Uh, it is an estrogen-dependent chronic inflammatory disease. And histologically, we expect that when the pathologist looks at the biopsies of lesions that we see at the time of laparoscopy, for example, that they identify both endometrial glands and stroma. Now remember, uh, it is an estrogen-dependent disease, but it, estrogen is not causal. That is, it is not estrogen that's abnormally high or low that's actually causing the disease. It is simply an important part of the maintenance of the disease. If you remove estrogen, you have atrophy. If you give estrogen, the glands will grow. However, the um, estrogen does not cause the disease itself. So let's look a little bit at the epidemiology. What are the risk factors, for example, that you should look for in your own patients so that you can make a determination whether this patient may or may not have uh, endometriosis? First of all, it is a very common disease. It's found in 10 to 15% of premenopausal women, postpubertal uh, girls. It is associated with the early age of menarche, a short cycle, menstrual cycle, and flow, which is quite heavy and lasting more than one week. All of these, therefore, alluding to the fact that the menstrual cycle, the way it starts, how long it is, uh, is probably causal, or at least associated with the probability within uh, patients that have a particular symptom complex uh, will have endometriosis as the cause of that symptom complex. It is also found mostly in nulliparous women and probably importantly there's a genetic influence or it's not clear what that genetic influence is. In particular, uh, if there's a family history of uh, endometriosis, then you will find that it is more commonly found in those patients that presents with the symptoms. So if someone has a sister or, a, or the mother has endometriosis and the patient presents with a disease complex, which we'll go through in, this, in, the, uh, in a minute, then in those patients you will have a higher probability of finding endometriosis. This is uh, an interesting study uh, showing putting endometriosis in the context of the cost to society. So if you look at this publication, this is actually a European initiated uh, study, but there were uh, two centers in the United States. There were 12 centers in all, two in the United States, of which one center uh, was here at the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, in that, we calculated the societal burden of endometriosis, and it was 49 billion euros. Again, the study was done in, was initiated in, in uh, Europe, and therefore they reported everything in euros. <clears throat> the most important of the cost, the societal burden, is in fact the productivity loss for women, uh, which was double the actual health care costs. But if you look at the health care costs, the um, surgical costs are probably the most critical and most important. Surgery, 29%, hospitalization, 18%. But if you look at the cost to society of endometriosis, uh, mostly due to quality of life, you'll see it's a substantial part. Of, uh, of what we see in this country. So what are the symptoms? The symptoms associated with endometriosis, and again I use the word associated because it may not be necessarily the endometriosis that's causing those symptoms, are related to pain and infertility. Specifically in the pain complex, we talk about, uh, we observe dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, and chronic pelvic pain, which is defined as non-cyclic pain, uh, and also we sometimes add uh, to the definition that the chronic pain 
should have been around for more than six months, although that's quite variable. And of course, infertility. These are symptoms. Infertility is a symptom. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, pathophysiology. <clears throat> so if you look in this slide, on the left, what you find is uh, retrograde menstruation uh, as an initiator of the event. However, retrograde menstruation occurs in the majority of women, but the majority of women do not have endometriosis. So therefore, at the bottom part of the uh, slide, on the left, you will see that this patient has not developed endometriosis in spite of the fact that menstrual effluent, which is the endometrium, regurgitates through the fallopian tube into the peritoneal cavity. On the right, instead, you have a regurgitation of uh, the fluid or the tissue into the peritoneal cavity, as would a normal woman. However, we suspect, because of the abnormal expression of certain genes, that this woman is prone to development of endometriosis, and therefore this endometriotic tissue or endometrium actually implants in the peritoneal cavity and then with the host response will lead to inflammation and adhesion formation and then possibly um, to the uh, symptoms of endometriosis. So if we look at the bottom right, a little circle, and we look more detail of what's happening at that level, what we find at the focal point of the disease is a pro-inflammatory medium. So we have a macrophage, activated macrophages, which are, um, are, are commonly found in the uh, peritoneal cavity. Uh, however, they're increased in number uh, and, and do not function quite well. These macrophages then interact with the endometrial implants, and those endometrial implants then secrete uh, pro-inflammatory uh, chemokines and cytokines that can lead to further manifestations of the disease, that is the physical manifestation of the disease, such as in, uh, inflammatory peritoneum adhesions, and may be associated with the actual symptoms of endometriosis, such as pain and infertility. Uh, so the, the, the focal point uh, is these pro-inflammatory areas of the in the peritoneal cavity around the implants. Okay, so the diagnostic workup. When we look at a diagnostic workup, what we're thinking is how can I predict whether this woman has uh, endometriosis based on history, physical exam, or whatever is non-surgical for me? Well, first of all, I must tell you that uh, there, are, there are no good uh, tests, either in history, or physical exam, or other uh, uh, biochemical tests that can predict uh, endometriosis uh, in a uh, highly sensitive way. The gold standard still is laparoscopy, which is a surgical intervention. Uh, however, we're going to go through what may have a higher probability of finding the endometriosis at laparoscopy. So if the patient presents with a history of dysmenorrhea, dyspernorrhea, uh, and non-cyclic pelvic pain, she, this patient most likely has endometriosis. However, um, uh, there are a significant group of patients that when you do a diagnostic laparoscopy with these symptoms, in fact, we do not find endometriosis. It is important not to label a patient of having endometriosis until the definitive diagnosis is made because the tendency is to attribute most symptoms afterwards to an endometriosis lesion where, in fact, it has never been proven. At the time of physical examination, if you find an adenexal mass and non-mobile uterus, or call the sac nedularity, you will, uh, in high probability, especially in a young woman, have uh, endometriosis. But nonetheless, it has limited value for assessing the extent of disease. If you do find these, which are not commonly found, then this really predicts endometriosis. What does not predict endometriosis is ordering a, a serum test, the CA125. Although, um, historically, people have ordered this test the sensitivity of this is, is actually quite poor, and if you try to increase the sensitivity, then of course the specificity uh, increases dramatically, uh, decreases dramatically, and therefore um, really of little value. So poor sensitivity and really poor specificity. So no role in the investigation of patients with these symptoms in order to predict the presence of endometriosis. 
Imaging may be of help, specifically transvaginal ultrasonography is highly sensitive and specific for the diagnosis of ovarian endometriotic cysts. Um, MR and CT have no added advantage, and therefore, <coughs> if the ultrasound is normal, and usually, in most circumstances, it is of no value to simply move on to a CT scan or MR. If you have to order an additional test, by the way, MR is far better for assessing the soft tissue of the pelvis than CT. CT has very little role. Imaging itself has low sensitivity and specificity for predicting peritoneal endometriosis, that is, non-ovarian disease, uh, and therefore is of little um, um, use if, you're tr if you have a normal ovaries, for example, and you're thinking of looking for other areas of endometriosis. <coughs> If you look on this slide, what you see in the bottom part, and the, and the upper part is the uterus, bottom part is a uh, rounded shape, um, endometrioma, and this is pretty classical for endometrioma. And uh, when an, um, a radiologist looks at this, um, although there is a differential diagnosis, the highest probability in reproductive age women, in fact, that it is an endometrioma. But it is not very good at identifying any other type of disease. What we are also interested in, from a, even from a gynecologist's point of view, is how do you predict really deep disease or deeply infiltrating endometriosis? So if you look at this um, uh, study by Chaperon in 2005, pre-surgical diagnosis of posterior deep infiltrating endo by a questionnaire, painful defecation during menses, severe dyspareunia, and previous surgery for endometriosis were the ones that predicted the patient had extensive severely infiltrating endometriosis. So this is what it looks like. If you look at the uh, figure, the picture on the right, what you find is that is a patient with the bowel, which is adherent to the cul-de-sac. Uh, uh, this patient has adhesions around the cul-de-sac, and uh, this is a typical picture of a patient who has deeply infiltrating endometriosis, which is defined as nodules extending more than five millimeters uh, beneath the peritoneum. Usually involves the urosacral ligaments, the vagina, the bowel, bladder, and of course the ureters. In this picture, if we look um, at what we can uh, predict, this is a woman with uh, endometriosis. If you look at the deep pelvis, the rectum is fused to the back of the vagina, obliterating the cul-de-sac. Transvaginal sonography with water contrast in the rectum uh, and in these circumstances, if you think the patient has rectal endometriosis, then an MRI would probably be of benefit. That's probably about the only time that I would think of ordering an MRI is if I think that the patient has deeply infiltrating bowel endometriosis, as you see on this uh, picture. This is an MRI of that particular patient, and what you see behind the cervix, you see the uterus in the picture, uh, and behind the cervix, there's usually a space, and that space has been um, obliterated by the endometriosis. So the area uh, in front of the rectum and behind the cervix, you see a lesion infiltrating the posterior part of the, cer of the uh, uh, cervix. In this, you see the fat layers of the rectum, and you see a nodule infiltrating in the rectum, and then infiltrating into the back of the cervix. So what is their differential diagnosis if the patient presents with these symptoms? Well, the first one we must consider is chronic pelvic inflammatory disease, and that one uh, gives similar uh, symptoms, uh, such as pain uh, and chronic pain, dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, and even infertility. Typically, a uh, patient had, does have a history, but not necessarily, and a uh, history also of sexually transmitted infection. Irritable bowel syndrome is often found in these patients with endometriosis and can be uh, responsible for some of the symptoms that we, uh, we will see. Painful bladder syndrome, such as interstitial cystitis, especially in women that present with the pain with a full bladder, for example, should can be considered. Pelvic adhesions, and of course, myofascial pain and other musculoskeletal disorders are often responsible either primarily or secondarily as a response to the chronic pain, uh, for additive pain, uh, myofascial pain, for example, of the, of the pelvis, the pelvic floor, is to be, should be considered. 
But the definitive, the definitive diagnosis is laparoscopy. Therefore, if someone um, wants to um, definitely have a definitive diagnosis, diagnostic laparoscopy is indicated. Typically, though, we do treat beforehand, before the laparoscopy, with simple methods so uh, that we don't have to resort to uh, laparoscopy immediately. At the time of laparoscopy, we do require uh, histological confirmation, although vis because of the visual, uh, visual diagnosis of endometriosis is not always confirmed. Uh, nonetheless, the societies have agreed that visual confirmation of endometriosis is an acceptable way of proceeding. But in patients that we feel that do require a more definitive diagnosis, uh, that is, there's a question of whether the endometriosis is present and responsible for the, the symptoms, uh, I would personally recommend the biopsy. Why? Well, if we look at this patient, this is the peritoneum, and, and, uh, and the peritoneum has a white puckered lesion, as you see over here, and if you um, biopsy this, then the, the pathologist will call this endometrial glands and stroma. In this patient, you see papillary lesions all across the peritoneum. And this uh, is uh, under the left ovary, and then you see the uterus in the midline, the uterosacral ligaments with further papillary lesions. And if you biopsy this lesion, it will be endometrial glands and stroma. This is a puckered lesion of the peritoneum, same area as the other two slides black lesion, white lesion, and if you biopsy this, it will be endometrial glands and stroma. Therefore, you see there are many phenotypes, and the phenotypes are often dependent on how much fibrosis, how much hemorrhage there is into the lesions. This is the right uterosacral ligament of a woman, and those red lesions on the uterosacral ligament also give the same histological diagnosis. Again, alluding to the fact that the phenotypes, the peritoneal phenotypes, are quite different. So what other diseases we may find with patients in endometriosis? Typically, we see atopic diseases and autoimmune phenomena, such as thyroid disease, but more commonly fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. And it is uh, observed that ovarian cancer has a higher relative risk uh, compared to women uh, with, uh, without endometriosis. You'll see in the next section when we talk about treatment outcomes, we have to understand the causality. And, in, and the causality is many times unclear. For example, if you have a patient with infertility and very little disease, uh, is that the true cause? Then you wind up treating endometriosis as the, uh, the trying to treat the infertility, but in fact, it is not the cause. Endometriosis may simply be uh, observed, but is not causal in that particular situation, and you have to look at male factor, ovulatory disturbance, etc. Same thing goes with chronic pelvic pain. It may not, the endometriosis present may not be causal. Endometriosis does occur in women without any particular symptoms. So you, it is very important to look for associated syndromes, especially in light of the fact uh, that uh, in, in, in patients that do not respond to the uh, to traditional, uh, more conservative methods. The other uh, um, observation has been in patients that uh, have incomplete surgical treatment, for example, if you take them to the operating room, remove only half the, the endometriosis load, uh, and you're reading the operative report, and the surgeon, because of an experience, I'm not noticing different phenotypes, they have not removed completely the endometriosis, um, you will say, well, the patient did not respond to surgery, in fact, you may not have responded to, to incomplete surgery. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the management of patients with endometriosis and in, uh, infertility.